So, it's my great, great pleasure to announce Aurora's talk, which is entitled How to Start at the Beginning the Machinery of Observation Statistics. Thank you. So the th first thing you'll notice is I changed the title. <laughs> <laughs> This morning, listening to Dan Sperber, I changed, rashly, uh, uh, changed the title uh, so that it would fit in a little bit with, uh, with what he was saying. And um, I don't really know if this new title fits, but I'm going to try to make it fit. And uh, we'll see by the time we get to the end whether this was a rash uh, or rational move to change it. Okay, so um, I want to introduce some of my wonderful collaborators uh, 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 with whom I've been working for several years, especially John Truswell, of course, um, on um, uh, early aspects uh, of the learning of the meaning of words. So uh, turning to that topic, um, Here's the question for today, or the beginning of the question. Uh, how would you learn the meaning of the word elephant? Okay, well, everybody knows the answer to that question, right? Uh, uh, everybody knows it. Uh, you know it. John Locke knew it. Uh, the taxi cab driver knows it. Taxi cab drivers always annoy me. What do you do for a living? I study word learning. Well, don't the kids just say what their parents say? Uh, yes, that's the right answer, but it's not as easy as you think. Uh, so that's what every justifiably uh, uh, everybody believes that at least a lot of the work is done and a lot of the work starts here uh, by uh, uh, simply somehow uh, uh, showing people what's going on in the world. Uh, the child doesn't know any syntax yet, he doesn't know any distribution uh, uh, of all the words in the language yet, but um, what babies aren't capable of doing is looking around the world. So if they isolate a sound segment, uh, they it would seem reasonable, and it's certainly that's what the evidence shows us, they can look wildly around the world to see if they can discover the contingencies uh, for the use of some word. So elephant means elephant because it's used systematically in the presence of elephants and uh, less systematically in their absence. So about a minute after this theory was discovered, but, but uh, in ancient times, uh, uh, people immediately noticed that there was a difficulty. Uh, the problem is that you don't see an elephant all by itself. At least it's very rare to do so. Uh, there are other things around. Uh, the shoes around and uh, teddy bears perhaps and apples and so forth. And you don't hear just one word. Uh, you hear several words uh, and there are several things in sight. Uh, so how would you ever converge on elephant as the meaning of the word elephant? So that's the uh, uh, the problem I'm going to turn to as the first issue uh, today. Uh, so of course psychologists, this is just the kind of problem that psychologists adore, uh, and um, uh, they immediately have, an, well, you may have seen this answer already in Quine and uh, many other sources, but it's the first thing that would occur to you, is that while you can't solve that problem uh, uh, in any one observation, maybe you can solve the problem by collecting a bunch of observations in which you hear the, the sound elephant uh, and asking, over that set of circumstances, what remains the same? Uh, so as other things change, one would expect over time, uh, elephant survives uh, because sometimes there's a teddy bear, but not always, and so forth and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, as an association, the 
uh, if it rises to, to the top as your semantic conjecture. So here's just one rendition of it uh, from a computer scientist fairly recently. Okay, so this is looks like good old associative statistical learning. So we want to ask the question of whether it's true that words are learned by cross-situational observation roughly of this sort, where you aggregate instances over, uh, uh, over time uh, and choose the one that fits the most context. Okay. Uh, so, of course, since the problem's been discovered, uh, it's been uh, well studied in the psychological laboratory. Uh, in fact, there's a recent and very uh, famous, widely cited uh, article by uh, Ewan Smith. There's several follow-up articles uh, by this time on this topic uh, about how such an associative scheme would work. Uh, and the way the issue is solved in their laboratory and many other laboratories uh, is actually you show learners, undergraduates of course, uh, uh, a bunch of uh, pictures of this sort. Uh, and as you show them the pictures, you also say for an equal number of nonsense words, uh, and uh, then you show them uh, there's one set, uh, and after that you show them another set uh, in which some of the items change and some of the items don't change. So you can sort of see how this kind of procedure uh, would be assumed to work, uh, and uh, in fact uh, uh, they report uh, that changing the degrees of, the degree of uncertainty, two items at a time, three items at a time, four items at a time, and at the end they give you a test. So you have to make a choice out of four items. What do you think might been meant? What do you think Zant meant? Uh, and so forth. Uh, and you can see by looking here that even when it's four words at a time, thus four icons at a time, over approximately six or seven trials in which the items are changing and the words are changing, uh, people are doing uh, significantly better than chance uh, in uh, guessing which word goes with which meaning. Okay, so that's sort of the basic paradigm we're looking at. Uh, and I want to first ask two questions about that. Uh, and that will occupy about half of our time. Uh, and the first question uh, is, is that anything like the real world? Okay, so up here we're looking at um, two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five is still probably better than chance. But here's the world. Uh, probably the world uh, in which you really learn the meaning of the word shoe. Uh, and there's the shoe. And when you, when, you, when you think about the complexity of any scene, you can look around this room, you see the same thing. Uh, it isn't a matter of selecting shoe from four choices. If you conceive of the problem in this way, the thousands and thousands of choices. If, it, if you don't know what the atomic semantic entities are, and I'm sure you don't because nobody does, it's not only the thousands of things you might be able to name here, but the more tens of thousands of them two at a time, like black shoe, for example. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the idea seems to be absurd when you really think about the complexity of the real world in which you learn the meaning of the word shoe. I mean, I acknowledge if you live in a middle class household, maybe your parents have a picture book in which they teach you a few items. But basically, you learn the meanings of words in these complex real environments. 
uh, and without any specific instruction. So this is a question of will, will this laboratory demonstration scale up to anything like the world in which we know the, the children are acquiring word meanings. And my second question. Um, okay, so there's your first question. Uh, uh, is this laboratory situation anything like the world? Uh, and the second question uh, has to do with um, how does, what kind of learning machinery uh, uh, is accounting even for what those people are doing in the laboratory? Okay, never mind what happens in the real world. But I just showed you a laboratory experiment. It had what we call significant results, uh, seemed to account for a phenomenon, but the only measure that the authors gave us was a measure of final attainment, right? So we saw at the end uh, that people were better than chance. Uh, and if you look a little more closely by trial uh, at experiments like this, uh, you'll see that indeed you seem to be get, getting gradual learning. So if you look on the third trial, a larger, num a larger proportion of your subjects will have the word correct than they will on the first trial. And on the fifth trial, even more of them will be correct. But notice that that doesn't necessarily mean that anything gradual was going on in word learning. It doesn't mean an associative, aggregated uh, uh, kind of system like I showed you before. So for instance, uh, and this is well known, uh, but ignored again and again, suppose everybody learns any word that they learn on a single trial, but you can't tell which trial the subject will learn it on. You're going to generate the same curve, right? Everybody, suppose you have one trial learning uh, is what's responsible. That's the real machinery of learning here. But the later you look across trials, of course, the more people will have had their one trial successful case of a one trial learning. So if you um, pool the subjects or pool the responses, you're going to get a curve that looks like this. Well, we really don't know what the machinery looks like uh, simply by looking uh, at final attainment and saying, look, it's above chance. So that's the second issue I'm going to look at. OK. Um, uh, and here's how we do it. Uh, uh, we have developed a technique over the last 20 years or so uh, uh, in which uh, we, we actually look at um, parental speech to children uh, early uh, in the word learning process. Okay, children usually about 14 to 18 months of age, uh, and we videotape them. Uh, we have the huge library of this, these videotapes. Uh, we cull the videotapes to find the most frequent words that mothers use and that children learn uh, early so that we have enough stuff to experiment with. So we just look at uh, uh, the most frequently occurring content words in parental speech to very young children. Right? And what we want to know uh, is how, how they use those corpora to learn, okay? Because, because we're looking at the real environments. Okay. So we select randomly success, uh, 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 choose six instances uh, of each of these 48 words. There are, in fact, 24 nouns and 24 verbs. 24 most frequent nouns, 24 most frequent verbs uh, within and across mothers in these uh, uh, video corpuses. And, um, okay, uh, and we edit, we, we, we select them, uh, we edit out a 40 second, what I'll call a vignette, uh, a little videotape, uh, and then uh, we introduce 
our wonderful methodological advance, uh, which is turning down the audio. Okay. We do that for two reasons. First of all, because if we, we're going to submit these scenes to people to guess what the word means, well, you already know what bunny means, so if I say bunny, that, that won't tell me anything, so turn off the sound. The second reason is serious, because uh, we're trying to think of the child at the stage before it has other sources of information, such as syntax, uh, such as um, uh, the distribution of words within s sentences. So we just want to know, can you learn the meaning of a word uh, by observing the circumstances in which it's used? And if you can't do it on a signal trial, can you do it by cross-situational observation? Okay, so that's the question. Now comes the word. Okay, so the sound is turned off, and um, the, the only thing you hear is at exactly the moment the mother says the mystery word, and these are the instructions to the subject, uh, you'll hear a beep on this otherwise silent tape. Okay, so you know when during this 40 second vignette. Uh, the mother or father is uttering this new word, and your job is to guess the word. Okay. Um, okay. So, okay. So, let me show you a little bit about how that goes. Okay. So, I mean, there's simply a depiction of it. It's really video. It's not stills. Okay. So you're watching something's happened. There's a, you know, there's a shoe there. Uh, the kid goes and gets the shoe. The father says something about a shoe. At that point, you hear a beep. Uh, and the scene continues for another uh, 10 seconds or so, and that's all there is to that. So that's the basic paradigm. I'm going to call this the norming study because in this case, you can't do any cross-situational learning. Why is that? Because all the words sound the same. They're all pronounced beep. So there's no way you could ask about recurrences of the word against the scene. So we're just asking here, what can you get out of a scene, right? Why, you might think about watching your television set with the sound off. You might try that when you get home tonight or some night, uh, and you'll find out how appallingly difficult it is to try to guess you might be able to say, guess something about the gist of the scene, but to try to guess exactly what people are saying is um, very difficult, as I'll show you. Okay. All right. What's going on here? Okay. Uh, uh, so here's the procedure, really. Um, we know that mothers don't ordinarily say, shoo, 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 uh, uh, five times in a row. Rather, the word shoe will occur in some conversation, and then later in another conversation it will occur again, and so forth and so on. So we're going to distribute the six cases of the utterances of shoe and intersperse them with all the other words uh, the, uh, and filler words and so forth that the subject is to learn. Okay, so for example, uh, here's a uh, first video. The subject makes a guess, writes down his answer, uh, and also gives a confidence rating. Then he sees another scene. This happens to be a horse video. Uh, subject makes a guess as to what that means, uh, and so it goes. Uh, eventually he sees another scene, takes another guess. Uh, this happens to be another shoe scene, and so forth and so on. Uh, till he's been through the 12 times 6 plus fillers. Hey. Question? What? You don't know. Maybe it's a shoe scene. Maybe it's a shoe scene. Ha-ha. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Didn't quite teach you that. <laughs> That's the problem, my dear. <laughs> That's the problem. Both of you. Yes. Okay. It's gonna. Things are gonna get worse before they get better. Okay. All right. So, so that's basically the paradigm. Uh, all right. And um, no opportunity for cross situational learning because all the words are pronounced the same way, namely B. Okay. So let's see what happens. The first shoe video happens to be one in which 8% of the subjects guess it correctly. Just from that one video, a 40 second video, it's not just a picture. Okay. Uh, as for the first horse picture, it happens to be very good. Uh, over 80% of the subjects guess it correctly. Uh, here comes the next shoe thing, and we have the marina problem. <laughs> she thinks it means truck, okay? Uh, and that's a problem, all right? So let me tell you how these data look in general. 90% uh, of, this is really amazing. 90%, these are selected nouns and verbs. The first 48 words a baby learns the highest frequency ones in the whole corpus. You've known these words since you were 15 months old, 18 months old, okay? And you know from the situation, it's a mother speaking to a baby who can understand the context. Uh, and um, uh, for 90% of them, it's terrible. Okay, they're really low quality. You can't learn, uh, you can't guess the meaning of the word. Okay. And the best is nouns and verbs together, yes. Okay. Se okay, so far it's nouns and verbs together. 7% of them uh, are high quality. What do I mean by high quality? I don't mean people all guess them correctly. I mean, at least 50% of the subjects guessed it correctly, okay? So you've got a fighting chance on 7% of the videos. I mean, this is really pretty low information, so this is low quality source of information, much worse than you might uh, have thought. As you guessed, Sharon, all of the ones that are high quality, turn out to be nouns within that corpus uh, and turn out to be nouns that name whole objects at some middling level of abstraction, whatever that means. Okay, sort of Russian things, doggy and chew and so forth and so on. You can't learn tail, like the tail of a dog. You can't learn puppet, like the elephant is a puppet, but you can't learn that. You certainly can't learn any verbs. By you, I mean you undergraduates uh, who are serving as the uh, subjects in these experiments. And neither can three-year-olds who we enlist to be subjects in these experiments do. In fact, the three-year-olds don't do as well as, as the undergraduates. It's really hard. So. What we're going to do now uh, is we're going to take the pitiful few cases uh, of um, whole object nouns for which there was at least one good high quality piece of input, okay, where 50% or more of the subjects guessed it correctly from a single observation, and we're going to investigate what this learning procedure for them looks like. Uh, this isn't all so hopeless. You shouldn't be saying to yourself, uh, and as a matter of fact, I'll prove it to you later, that, oh well, this can't be the right way. The, the real world must be better than that. It isn't. Learning at this point where all you're using is the outside world, infants' first 50 words or so, 
learning is very, very slow, by which I don't mean you're doing cross-situational learning. By w I only mean you're learning a word maybe once a week, and you learn a few words, and you forget those, and then you learn a few, and they don't seem to mean anything. First 50 words, sort of a, a mess. Uh, so this is probably, and as I'll show you, demonstrably a, f a fair test, uh, because this is the real environment. Okay. So now we're going to see, can we do better by doing cross-situational observation? Okay. So now everything looks the same as the uh, uh, procedure I showed you before, except that now we're going to name uh, the new word. Okay, so now uh, every word in the test gets its own nonsense syllable. So vash will happen to be shu. Okay, so now if you're capable of remembering uh, anything like that, Here's what happens in the in this procedure. Okay, you get a shoe video, uh, then you get a horse video, uh, then after a while you get another shoe video, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, but if you remembered vash, that vash occurred twice, it'll occur five times, of course. Uh, you you may be able to. This is the idea, of course, situational learning. If you could remember. The two uses of vash that might narrow down the meaning for you, right? So that's the idea, of course, situational observation. You remember something from all of your observations of the word vash, uh, uh, and and uh, try to to come to the best fitting solution. Uh, and then after after all of the. Uh, uh, similarly, have been given, you also give your final guess on what you think each of these words means. Okay. Now, at last, I want, if this will play, uh, I'd like to show you um, a, um, uh, one of these videos, just so you, you sort of have a feel for what's going on. If it will play. So we shall see. And um, I don't think the sound will play. So when we get to the place where the father says the word, I will say it. I will say mypen, okay? And you might make a little note as to what you think this word means. Oh, I'll be so disappointed if it doesn't. Okay. You know what it means? Oops. Say that. Uh, all right, so let me tell you one more thing about the procedure here, okay? So we are going to manipulate the distribution of informative in events, okay? We're going to try to map what's going on for the nouns, these trivially simple nouns, uh, in the real world as we discovered it from the norming study. So for the na for these for so these whole object nouns, the subjects are guessing at 50% of the time for uh, one-fifth of those whole object nouns. So we're going to give them one of those high quality inputs for every five inputs that they give. But, okay. Uh, then the research.
All right, so we're going to assign them to different orders. Now, if you're thinking about an associative scheme, you might wonder why. Because after all, in an associative scheme, you're going to aggregate across all of the um, uh, uh, different instances in which you heard the word might then and choose the best one. So it really shouldn't matter what order you get them in. But for all we know, the order might matter. Because for all we know, it might not be an associative learning procedure. So we're going to manipulate uh, uh, the order in which these things occur. So either the high informative case is going to be the first of five, uh, the third of five, the fifth, or there won't be any such informative case. Okay? So that's sort of the design the experiment. All right? Uh, and our question is going to be, do we get this gradual learning curve? Right? And if we do get this gradual learning curve, uh, can we assign it to associative learning? Okay. Uh, if it's associative learning, we ought to see a few things. First of all, you ought to have a lot of hypotheses on earlier trials, because you haven't made up your mind yet, right? You haven't got enough trials to, to decide what, what the word means. But as trials proceed, you'll be narrowing down the meaning. So at first you ought to have quite a few hypotheses in mind. Uh, and um, the order in which you receive them doesn't matter. Because by the end of the five trials, you have all, all the subjects have all and only the same information. OK, so now finally let's see what happens. All right? So. Uh, this is what happens. Uh, remember, there's a condition in which you get no high-quality input. None of the 50%. You're only getting the 33% ones. And under these conditions, so there is no high-quality input. There is no learning. Right? So our subjects are like dead. They never get any place uh, uh, in this situation. Uh, on the contrary, if they get high quality a high quality input as the first one that they hear, you get some respectable learning. You don't get a rise over the five trials notice. If anything, you get a fall, uh, presumably because subjects sort of forget that they heard Vash and so forth. So learning dips to some extent, but then it stays reasonably stable uh, at about at about 40% of the cases. So you, you learn under these circumstances. You don't learn well, but you learn. Uh, now suppose your high quality input occurred as the third of the five stimuli. Now you get a bump. You guess, tend to guess correctly on the high quality input, but it doesn't do you any good, you lose it. Right? By the time you get to the fifth one, you're back where you started from. Uh, and if you get the high quality input last, uh, it doesn't do you any good whatsoever. All right? So we have a huge effect of order here. We learn, roughly the result is, you learn if you get high quality input as the first time that you hear the word. And under other circumstances, you may get a temporary bump, but you don't learn. Okay? Uh, and it doesn't matter whether it was something that by the accuracy of the group we called high quality input or not. Here it's split, but split two ways, first by uh, whether you got it correct on the first trial, in which case there's learning, or you got it incorrect on the first trial, in which case there's no learning. And that's true, the solid line, whether we called it high quality or low quality. The story is a very simple one. You learn on the first observation. You learn on one trial, 
uh, learning doesn't get any better, and as far as further observations are concerned, they tend to be obfuscating. They get in the way. Uh, there is no course situation of learning uh, in this study. Okay. Uh, a, a little more detail, subjects repeat when they had it correct on the first trial, and if they didn't have it correct on the first trial, they don't repeat. Uh, and there's one very important further aspect to these data. If the subject guesses correctly on the next trial, he does seems to do a little test. He seems to look for verification as uh, uh, of his original guess. So how are we going to measure verification? Notice we had that norming study, and what that norming study actually gave us is the set of all, since we had lots and lots of subjects, all of the plausible guesses you might make from one observation, for instance, Marina's observation. So on one observation, it seemed to mean truck, right? Uh, so here what's being asked is, assuming you guessed correctly, you guessed shoe, is there even a weak possibility of interpreting the next observation as shoe? Right? Did it appear on the plausibility list in the norming study? And if so, that's that. Now you've learned the word. If not, you throw it away and you start all over again. That's what the machinery seems to look like. Okay? All right, so let me summarize uh, uh, what, what learning looks like from this uh, kind of test. Uh, gradual learning from low informative information just doesn't seem to happen. Uh, successful learning depends on the presence of a high informative uh, instance, which we poetically call uh, the epiphany item. Uh, low informative observations after you get the good one just tend to get in the way. They just tend to mess up your head. Uh, at, they don't add to your knowledge uh, uh, at all. Right? So it doesn't look like cross-situation of uh, uh, learning. So, uh, learning, in short, looks rapid uh, rather than incremental, at least from this test. All right. uh, last word about this experiment, uh, which I hope is going through your mind. Since the first observation is crucial, you might ask yourself the question, uh, could this really be right? I mean, what if you get a terrible case, a low informative case of cow, as the first time you hear cow. Does that mean you're doomed for the rest of your life you can't learn the word cow? That can't be right, okay? That can't be the story we're telling. Uh, in order to not be forced to tell that story, uh, we did what's often called the sleep study, all right? So we give the subject a couple of trials but not the crucial trial with high information. So these are subjects who either got the high would either get the high information on the third trial or the fifth trial. But instead, we give them the first two trials, and we say, go home and sleep, come back the next day. Actually, we did it two days later, and now they get the other three. three. So the third trial is now first trial for them. And the results are now reproduced, uh, the results of a first trial. So it looks as if tomorrow is another day. Uh, you forget how all this bad information messed up your head, and you can learn again. Okay. Uh, so much for that. Uh, now I want to turn back to the laboratory. Because having satisfied ourselves to some degree as to what happens in a real learning situation that is at least our materials are real. At least these are the real observations uh, that children must be getting. Uh, uh, but there's a lot that we can't tell. There's a lot that we can't control in that kind of situation. So now I'm going to return to the laboratory 
and do what other people did and have these silly little icons um, uh, and see if we can look and see uh, if what the machinery uh, of learning, even in this situation, looks like. Is it going to be aggregate associative learning or is it going to be one trial learning? So, oops. Here we ask our subjects, we show them uh, uh, five of these objects. Um, uh, they're they're going to learn 12 words. We distribute them. Uh, we, again, we can, we can change the degree of uncertainty by giving them five at a time, four at a time, three at a time. So we're going to vary that parametrically over uh, little experiments in this uh, vein uh, and um, uh, and let me tell you the logic of this these experiments okay so uh, here's how it goes consider the following situation you're looking at your first stimulus you're told learn these words or click on the one you think is the right answer so you're looking at five things you don't know which one is the right answer uh, uh, you take a guess, right? And you should be right 20% of the time. Uh, all right, so suppose you guess a door. That'll be right 20% of the time. But suppose door isn't really the answer. The real answer is bear. Notice which change our bears, at least, okay? It's not exactly the same icon of a bear. All right? And here's the crucial question. Okay, as to what this machinery looks like. If you're doing cross-situational learning, that must mean you preserved information from the first trial. You get to the second trial. It, you guess door, but it can't be door because there isn't any door there, right? So you have to guess something else. If you remember Hmm, but there was a bear in the first trial. That's what cross-situational learning means. If you have any memory uh, uh, of the other items from the first trial, then what should happen? You're going to guess bear more than 20% of the time on the second observation. Is that obvious? Because that's what this whole thing is about. That's obvious, right? So that's the question we're asking. Uh, do you guess bear more than if bear's the right answer and there was a bear? Because so, so now you've had bear on both trials, right? Are you going to be guessing bear more often? Uh, right. So on the associative scheme, you would be guessing it more often. Uh, but on a scheme which is one trial learning, you forget. And that's what we seem to see in the other earlier experiment, although we couldn't quantify it in the same way. You seem to preserve nothing except the guess that you made. Right? right? So if you only preserve from the first trial door, then when you see bear on the second trial, you're just going to guess it 20% of the time. Okay. So, uh, uh, so we do a series of these uh, studies, right? Uh, and what do we see? Of course, if we aggregate the results, we see um, uh, what looks like gradual learning. But now we want to ask about what is the machinery um, uh, that g is generating uh, this curve, right? Is it everybody's learning on one trial? Uh, or is it um, slow learning, a course drive? Okay. All right. Uh, and, and these are the results that we get, uh, which are shockingly neat. Um, I just don't remember what they are. If you guess correctly, not surprisingly, you're going to guess bare at a much higher proportion the second time you see it, right? But if 
you had guessed, if you guessed door, you guess bear exactly 20% of the time. So there was no saving. No saving uh, at all uh, uh, from the first study. And that happens again and again. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you compare wrong guesses to the norming study, when you saw this in isolation, it's exactly the same result. Right? So there's nothing left but your current hypothesis. So that's what it looks like people are doing. You see a word in a context, you form a hypothesis, you keep the hypothesis, you get to the next trial, you seek at least weak confirmation of your hypothesis. If it is confirmed, that's it. And you keep that maybe for the rest of your life. Maybe you hold that word uh, in memory. If it's wrong, you just start all over again. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not going to go through everything. We try to make this easier and easier and easier and easier and easier. So we give people five easy, low uncertainty cases, two at a time, and so forth. Okay. You would think, under this miserable circumstance, ridiculously different from the real world, uh, at least now you ought to be guessing more than 50% of the time uh, that is bare. Uh, and um, basically, uh, uh, here are the results across various degrees of uncertainty. If it's two at a time, you begin to see something faint, but it's so unrealistically, insanely different from any word, word, word learning difference that it's of no interest. Uh, finally, you might say, well, but notice you had to keep making forced choices here. It could be that the fact of making forced choices uh, uh, is what um, uh, is causing some of this behavior. Maybe it's not realistic because uh, if you remember the Ewan Smith experiment, they didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to make any choices along the way. Maybe the fact of making choices uh, is itself uh, causing this phenomenon. So here we use an implicit measure, namely eye tracking. So we're asking whether on the basis of what you saw in the first trial and then on the second trial, whether your pattern of inspection of the second scene is influenced uh, by what happened in the first scene. So okay, it's an eye tracking experiment. Uh, and now again, we're asking the question, uh, are you going to look at the bear more than 20% of the time? Okay. Uh, okay. So the way this is set up, uh, is um, um, uh, we are looking at the amount of time after the stimulus comes on, okay, uh, that you're looking at a bear, uh, or which is the real target, versus looking at uh, an arbitrarily chosen competitor, in this case, uh, the guy, okay? So if you're looking at the bear, we count that as uh, one minus uh, the percentage of the time that you were looking at the car. So if you're looking at the bear more than chance, uh, you're going to be above the line. All right. Uh, and here are the results. Uh, the dark blue is showing you when the subject was correct on the first trial. The subject correctly guessed that it was bare. Now in the second trial, not surprisingly, uh, he looks more and more and more uh, uh, at the bear over the time that he's looking at the second stimulus. Uh, but look what happens in the light blue. There is no difference between the amount of time he spends looking at the bear when he gets wrong than the amount of time that he spends looking at the car. Okay, so it's exactly the same result that you saw before, uh, only uh, done with an implicit test. Uh, and again, uh, this can be done 
and was done parametrically, changing the degrees. Uh, uh, and the only time we get even a fragile, tiny little memory of something else is when it's two by two. Okay. In other words, having reduced the experiment uh, to uh, uh, an absurd uh, 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 mimicking uh, of what the world of women must look like. Okay, so let me summarize. Uh, even with very simple simuli, uh, the single hypothesis uh, testing uh, learning procedure seems to, to predominate. This is why I called this learning general on the first slide. That's why I chose the name. Uh, because there's a, been a long hidden tradition in psychology, uh, uh, starting maybe with um, uh, people like Guthrie uh, uh, in the 50s, when every, almost everybody was an associationist. There were always a few little people having trouble, like Luca, getting their papers published, who were saying, I could swear this looks like one child learning, okay? Uh, but they were like swamped uh, by this deep belief of, um, uh, uh, in association, but they always existed, okay? Because it always was clear mathematically, it all could be one child learning, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and basically it is. Okay, so uh, here's our story. When you hear a novel word, propose a meaning based on the context, okay? Um, you store it in your lexicon. When you hear the word again, uh, try to retrieve the meaning that you stored. Um, seek to verify it with the current hypothesis. If it's verified, that's good. Uh, uh, and that's your word. If it's not verified, uh, start it all over again. Okay. Uh, so I want to say, because I think I've taken up a lot of time, so I'm not going to get to all the wonderful things that I might tell you, um, the findings are actually quite consistent with what we know uh, about learning from the few brave people who are willing to say so through the years. Yes, you keep getting these aggregated curves, but you're just using the wrong statistic. You know, you're pooling when you shouldn't be pooling. When you look at the individuals here, uh, uh, they're learning in a single time. Uh, that's what's really going on, okay? Um, so let me just remind you of a couple of people you probably know. Uh, for instance, Randy Gallistow, uh who's desperately made this argument over a period of two decades before people were forced to, li to listen, even ants and wasps and um, uh, creatures of that sort, seemed to perform at a very low level for a long period of time and suddenly, you see, sudden change. That's what you really see. But if you pull all the subjects together, it's going to look like you have a gradual uh, curve. Uh, some of you developmentalists may remember um, uh, uh, people like Bauer. Uh, in the, uh, there's a wonderful recent article by uh, uh, Roddy Redeker in the memory literature, uh, which tells the story uh, very nicely. Uh, and I recommend it to you. Not only that, but this kind of story is consistent with what we have always observed about vocabulary learning. So I don't know why this isn't what people believed in the first place. You all remember Susan Carey and fast mapping. Well, if you know anything about language learning, looks like kids are, are very often learning words on a single trial or a very, very few trial. It's easy to demonstrate in the laboratory. It seems to be the rule. Just arithmetically, you couldn't possibly explain how kids know as many words as they do. If you remember Noam Chomsky said the other night, children seem to be learning. You can just do the arithmetic, as Clinton would say. Children are learning a new word, uh, uh, about one word per working hour, per waking hour. 
month after month, year after year. Uh, so they have vocabulary of five to 7,000 words by the time they reach their, I don't remember, I think it's the fourth birthday, something of that sort. Uh, so we know about this, okay? Uh, uh, that's what we seem to be seeing. Uh, and there are good logical reasons uh, for, to believe that this is the way it has to be. Because as I did try to say informally at the beginning, the idea of aggregate learning over the set of possible things that a word could mean in the complex situation of any scene you're in is, is completely absurd. It's absurd on the face of it. The number of hypotheses grows and grows. It's going to grow over trials instead of reducing over trials. Because every new scene that's introduced is going to introduce more thousands of possible and not even absurd uh, hypotheses. The so number of hypotheses is going to rise over number of trials, there's no way in the world that you could remember all of these uh, and then do this uh, uh, winnowing uh, procedure. So it's implausible on the face of it. Now I should say, impossible on the face of it. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, A final detail, of course, is how if, if you're going to choose one meaning, how are you going to avoid error? Uh, and that's what the confirmation procedure uh, is all about uh, in the story that we're telling. Okay? So the chances are when you see an elephant and you hear the word elephant, uh, but really your mother meant rooster because she was saying, that elephant doesn't look anything like a rooster or something weird like that. But the chances on the next trial also that you're going to see an, uh, a, a rooster and hear the word elephant are vanishingly small. So the structure of the data set assures pretty well, uh, and in our data, uh, that if you don't get verification, you drop the hypothesis and start all over again. And so, so error is avoided by the verification procedure. Oh, so uh, let me end here. It's about time, right? Um, and uh, if you uh, uh, ask me the right questions, I can show you the 5,000 other slides uh, I, I have ready uh, uh, to show you. Uh, but. This is, as far as we can see, what the first uh, interface of language with the world. Uh, it, it's very difficult. Uh, it's very slow. That is to say, it, it, there are only sporadic cases in which it works. Right? It's replaced, but uh, almost immediately. Uh, after a few months or so, uh, with a with a domain specific procedure that de depends very much on uh, language facts, but you need this first interface to get into the system at all. Uh, first of all, uh, on pain of question begging. Because you can't say you learn the syntax from the semantics, you learn the semantics from the syntax, and so forth and so on. You have to have a grounding procedure someplace. And it looks like this is it. Okay? And this is all it does. It gives you a few seed nouns, uh, uh, and it, that enables the rest of the system to grow. So, thanks very much for listening. Stay away. <laughs>
just a question, very basic and very uh, probably I'm completely ignorant of what you presented us, but I'm wondering whether with the symbolic or abstract uh, words, uh, the learning procedure you think is the same uh, as in the case of concrete nouns, for example. So it's a word like fantasy or a word like, uh, I don't know, concrete. How can we learn these kind of associations? Yeah, of course. Of course, that would take us many, many more hours. Uh, but the answer, let me, let me just show you, show you something. Well, that's a good thing to say. You, you're right. Pitifully few words are learned this way. Okay? Uh, you can't even learn a verb like jump from watching jumpers jumping. Okay? I mean, that's pretty concrete. But people don't say jump when they see a scene like this. You don't want to know what they say, but they don't say jump. Okay. How about think? It's even oops, it's even worse. Okay. So you learn you learn these concrete nouns first. Even though your mother is saying all sorts of things, she's saying I love you and other fancy abstract things of that sort, and I think you should go to bed now. Uh, you don't learn the verbs. The output looks entirely different from the input. All you learn are these little nouns, and you learn them very slowly. Uh, and a lot of people think you can't learn a word like think because it's so hard and abstract and deep. Uh, but the real answer is you can't get evidence from the world, and the only evidence you have to start with is the world. That's why you only learn the concrete nouns. But the concrete nouns are going to give you something else. They're going to give you the wherewithal to begin to build the phrase structure. That's when you're going to get a uh, domain-specific interface with the syntax semantics, universal syntax semantics linking in your language. So let me just show you. I should, all right, and, and all these words, Noam Chomsky again mentioned some of them the other night. You can't learn this stuff by looking around and seeing what's, what, what's going on in the world when you hear probably. What are you supposed to look at uh, 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 in the world? Oh, but now let's go back to the Jabberwocky technique. In other words, let me show you uh, uh, a set of um, um, uh, syntactic structures uh, of English. Now it turns out entirely different words are easy to learn. You can't learn doggy from this kind of information, at least in a language like English, which doesn't inflect over, over the nouns. Uh, you can't learn jump. There's very little information about jump. But there's a lot of information about mental verbs, just the ones that are not concrete. So you can't learn them from the world. You have to learn them some way. Once you've acquired the syntax using those seed words, you're in a position to represent the input like this, right? So I, sh I should have done it in a different order because, but this is think, obviously, or no, something like that. It's, it's not think. Do you know what it is? Do you know what tilt means? It means no, that's right, okay? And you didn't see anything in the world. No, would it have done you any good to see anything in the world? Because knowing is not visible. The, the state of knowing is not visible. But the, the information more and more and more, very rapidly, by the time you're three years old, most of the information is coming from internal linguistic evidence. But we have to take those first words very, very seriously because we couldn't learn the structure without using those seed words to discover uh, the basic clause level uh, structure of the language, which then enables this kind of thing. 
Thank you for asking that question. Yes. Um, I would like to turn your argument around because one way of seeing your experiments is uh, to to show that work learning actually works. That's Ansgar someplace, right? Yeah. yeah. That way. Yeah. Talk clearly. <laughs> so um, one way of seeing your um, work learning experiments is that they might show that work learning works in the same way as in conditioning experiments because also in conditioning experiments um, learning is abrupt for instance when a rat associates um, a light with electroshocks so if that is the case because in um, both the associative learning literature and also in the uh, work learning literature you have this abrupt kind of one trial learning what is it that um, enables humans but not say dogs or other animals like this to acquire this lexicon of 50,000 words. Could you translate? <laughs> Not into English, but into sound. Associative literature. The thing is, you have the microphone in front of your mouth, so lip reading was hard. What I'm saying is that your argument can be turned around. Your argument can be <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eska. Thank you, Luca. <laughs> Are there any other questions? <laughs> Ask away. Luca will answer. This, this betrays my ignorance, too. But I, I wonder, uh, is there a difference in pre-verbal to start using nouns? Um, from what we can gather, what they really understand. So clearly when they learn doggy and you say, bring me the doggy, you, you know what they understand. And when you say, you know, give this to that, we also know that they understand the syntax. But in terms of these other things like thought, you know, mommy thought, like, you know, um, thought, 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 or uh, seem, seem, or, you know, these uh, ephemeral things. Uh, how do we know that pre-verbal infants have uh, understand the same as later on when they can verbalize? That, right? Yeah, there are a couple of questions you can do. First, there's a lot about pre-verbal infants. Really, there's a chance that some of them are But this is nouns, right? I must. What about these? What about these other ones? That you know, these conce conceptual ones. Do we? Do we know? Thank you. 
There you go. There just isn't any information. Even if I tell you about who's speaking, who's speaking, and who's not speaking. It's the speaking of the Spirit behind you, and the voice of the Lord is saying, This is the Spirit. You can't say it. You can't say it now. So, so those are the two main explanations. Either it's two different people who are doing a thinking because they just feel stressed or lazy, uh, or you couldn't get the information because you don't have the contact in the past. Now, the way people have looked at this in pretty much uh, is um, take a look at the information of a vaccine or a special connection of a vaccine. So we've got three to six year old children from China. To the United States and the United States of Chinese. Uh, they're, that's better than anything that we're doing. The way more countries can do it, that's just a thing. In fact, I could show you a report that we've got. Um, yeah, it was just kind of funny. What happened was uh, exactly the same thing happened. It's each Chinese. It was so true because... No, but it's a, it, I was happy with the explanation, but the, just a short prescriptive. The reason I asked is because when they become verbal, I thought, that I'm just going to hug, I'm not going to hug the floor, but when they start out talking and they have learned a new word, there's an exponential increase of using that word momentarily, right? As if they were uh, manipulating with it a lot. And I, I would like to know if there's an equivalent for that when they are pre-verbal, that you have any evidence that when they get it, that this thing is called that, that then there's an increased use. But there, I mean, you could think of tests. Well, I'm afraid we really have to stop here. Laila, thank you very much.